Hello, everyone. We're going to get started here in a few moments. Let people some time to get into the YouTube live stream and type in their questions if they have any on the Google Slide Deck. Just a reminder, if you want to participate in the live stream tonight, make sure you go to the link that will shortly appear at the top of the Google slide deck here. Enter into that link, and you can ask your questions during the, the live review session. It doesn't look like anyone's put any questions on the slides, but I'm assuming more will come up as we review. So let me go ahead and get this presented. Okay, so if you go to that link at the top of the slide, you should be able to ask questions live during the presentation tonight. If I could have someone test that out for me, it'd be greatly appreciated. Can everyone hear me okay? All right, we'll give people a few more minutes to get logged in here, and we'll get started. Thank you for letting me know that I can be heard and that the question and answer link is working. There we go. Hold on one second. All right, now we should be good to go. Sorry about that. All right, let's get going. 
So our first objective on this unit test is on gene expression. So someone asked the, actually asked a question. Um, can I go over the whole makeup of the test and the differing point part, point, different pointing parts and scales? But basically this test will be broken into two objectives. The major objective, which will probably have the most points um, allotted to it, will be the gene expression objective, where we had a lot of different things that we talked about in terms of how we can turn genes on and off in our in in cells, and then the second objective was on GMOs and PCR, which um, uh, wasn't as much as the first objective. So we'll definitely go over both those, and hopefully that answers your question. So when we first talk about gene expression, you have to remember um, from last unit the the process of building a protein starts with a DNA molecule. We go through transcription where we use that code in the DNA molecule to transcribe a, a template molecule called messenger RNA, which is then going to be translated into a sequence of amino acids which builds a protein. So in um, this unit, we talked really about how cells control this first part. How do we control transcription? So we got, got to review a little bit about how transcription works. Um, and the, the major player in transcription is this enzyme called RNA polymerase. We know it, <coughs> um, it's involved in transcription because polymerase means it's an enzyme. Anything ending in an ACE means it's an enzyme. And we're building a polymer. And what polymer are we building? Well, we're building RNA. Um, so RNA polymerase is responsible for transcription um, where we actually read a gene. And from that gene, we build a messenger RNA molecule which will eventually go to the ribosome and be translated into a protein. But in this unit, um, we're only worrying about uh, the, how do we control transcription. And so I want you to think about um, gene control as like an on-off switch uh, for a light, that genes can be on, genes can be off, depending on what's going on inside the cell. So our first um, big piece of information for transcription control is this concept that we have pieces of DNA that are not necessarily going to code for a protein, but are involved in the control of how the gene is going to be read. Uh, we have a promoter region of the DNA where the RNA polymerase, this big purple molecule, is going to find and bind to. That's kind of where the RNA polymerase starts. So it kind of marks the starting point for gene expression. Then we have this operator section. Some genes have an operator where a repressor protein actually binds um, and can block the RNA polymerase. So if we block RNA polymerase from attaching um, or from actually advancing to the genes, it does attach to the promoter, but it can't get past this repressor protein, no transcription is going to take place. No messenger RNA is going to be made. Therefore, no translation will take place. We look at our gene as being turned off. Um, so many of genes can be turned off in bacteria cells through this mechanism of a repressor blocking RNA polymerase. So we had two models that we looked at in our, in our unit to determine if a gene's turned on or off. We just looked at this one on the previous slide. Repressors in the way, RNA polymerase cannot get to the structural genes that need to be read for transcription. The gene is turned off. Well, how do we get this repressor removed? Well, we use a molecule called an inducer. An inducer fits in a special shape in that repressor protein, changes the repressor protein in such a way where it cannot bind to this operator, allowing RNA polymerase to squeeze by and actually read the gene to create messenger RNA to create a protein. Going back to this slide, we go through the whole process of transcription and translation if an inducer molecule is present. So that is one way cells can control how genes are turned on or turned off. All right, so we have a question right here that will pertain to this slide. Can you explain how the sugar was used as an inducer in the agar? What makes the sugar molecule an inducer? Well, what makes the sugar molecule an inducer, if you go back to here and look at this repressor protein, the sugar molecule has a special shape to it that fits in the repressor that causes that repressor to change shape. So only that sugar molecule, it happened to be a rabinose sugar, would cause the change of shape in that repressor, which allowed it to be removed, allowing transcription to take place. So in our lab, 
we had bacteria growing that had the gene in it, but they weren't controlling that gene, or they weren't, sorry, they were controlling that gene. They, they, that gene was not turned on because these molecules in the agar were not unlocking the repressor. The repressor was bound to the operator, blocking transcript. There was no sugar, no arabino sugar in the agar for the bacteria to use to unlock their repressors on that gene. The plate that did glow was the plus sugar plate. It did have that arabino sugar. It did have the inducer. The inducer bound to the repressor molecule, changed its shape, and transcription could take place. Translation could then take place, and these bacteria produced the green fluorescent protein that we were looking for. So that is how you answer this question. How was um, sugar used as an inducer? It removed the the repressor because it had the right fit. It fit the correct way. Think of it kind of like a lock and key type of example. All right, so in our lab, we had, again, two results. This was the first lab that we did this unit. It had you know, a plate that had growth on it. These bacteria had the gene present. That gene was just not turned on. And then we had bacteria that were expressing that gene and they were making the green fluorescent protein. And often it's asked, well, how do we know each bacteria had the gene? Well, if you remember, when you did the procedure, the, the bacteria came from the same tube. You did one, you had one tube of E. coli bacteria. We added the foreign jellyfish DNA to it, and we split the contents of that tube between these two plates. The only thing different about these two bacteria plates was this one had sugar, the arabino sugar in the agar, the inducer. This plate did not. Um, so that was kind of how that lab showed gene expression. That Bacteria can turn a gene on or turn a, keep a gene turned off with the uh, basically what's in their environment, with what's in their environment, like an inducer molecule. The other part of that lab taught us that we can actually genetically modify organisms by taking a gene out of one organism, like a jellyfish, and inserting it into a different organism, like a bacteria cell, and we get what's called a transgenic organism, an organism that has DNA from a different species or a completely different animal or organism for that matter. Um, so again, the gene from the jellyfish was inserted into the bacteria and we created transgenic organism. But what's amazing about DNA is that bacteria can read that jellyfish gene as if it were any of its own genes and transcribe it, translate it, and make a protein only if that gene is unlocked, if that gene is turned on. So again, going back to the analogy that we pulled from the lab, that we can have a model that looks like this, where you have kind of what the structure of the control mechanism looks like, where you have a RNA polymerase molecule that's able to read the structural gene because the repressor has been removed. This would be a gene that has been turned on. In this example in our lab was a bacteria plate that had green glowing proteins being produced by the bacteria cells. When a gene is turned off, that repressor protein is blocking RNA polymerase. RNA polymerase cannot read these structural genes and does not make the proteins. The bacteria cells have the gene. They just can't make the proteins because the gene has been turned off. So these are great models of gene expression. That's going to be something we're going to ask you in the test to be able to do is can you look at a model and explain what is going on in terms of gene expression? I'm going to pause here for a few moments to see if people have questions. So if you have questions, again, please use the link above. Um, ask those questions uh, before we move on and talk about what would be the next step once we actually produce a protein in a bacteria that we want. Great question. What molecule is actually glowing in the bacteria cell? It was protein. If you think back to our strawberry lab, that we did at the very beginning of the first unit. Um, straw, strawberry DNA was clear. Your DNA in your cheek cells was clear. The tube of bacteria DNA that we had um, in our PICO lab was clear, and I even held up a light to it. There was no fluorescent green being produced by that little vial of uh, DNA. DNA is clear. It does not actually give the actual... Um, appearance of the organism. It's the proteins that are made that actually cause the organism to be, in this case, glowing green. DNA is just the code to make the actual protein.
All right, any other questions before we move on? All right, so this part of the unit was probably the most vocabulary rich part, which definitely needs means you got to study some of these vocabulary words. You should know what RNA polymerase is. You should know what inducer what inducer molecules, what a repressor protein is, what what genes are and how genes relate to a protein. A gene is the code for a protein. I wouldn't worry so much about promoter and operator like you see here. You definitely need to know what transcription means um, and how that relates to uh, either the the gene being turned on or the gene being turned off. So those are some things you're gonna have to, to make sure you remember. In gene expression, is the DNA transcribed into RNA or messenger RNA, what is the difference? Um, RNA is a general term. Uh, there are different kinds of RNAs. So in gene expression, the DNA is transcribed into a messenger RNA molecule. Um, that's the only thing you really need to be worried about in this unit. So but there are, there are three different types of RNAs that we have talked about in this particular unit, on this particular unit assessment. You're only going to be concerned with messenger RNA because that is the molecule that we are either making or we're not making if the gene has been turned on or turned off in the cell. All right, so let's move on. Um, so the next step, like why why did we even talk about this? What was the big deal about making a bacteria glow green? You know, bacteria glowing green isn't going to be saving any kind of person. It's not going to save humanity from disease or going to help us in any way. It's more of a, a proof that we can actually take a gene from another organism, insert it into a bacteria cell, and get that bacteria to produce that protein that we want it to produce. So more realistic applications of this is not making bacteria glow green, but making bacteria produce other things. And we use the example in class of how we use bacteria to make human insulin. So swap out the gene for the green fluorescent protein and insert a gene for human insulin production. Put that into our bacteria plasmid. Have the bacteria take up that plasmid like we did in the lab for P-Glow. Engineer that bacteria to now start producing insulin, purify that insulin, and we now have a life-saving medication that can be cheaply and very efficiently made by bacteria cells. Um, so instead of using old traditional methods of gaining insulin from, you know, cadavers or dead animals, we can now make human insulin very inexpensively and very um, in mass quantities for all the people that need it. So you can almost look at this as any gene that we can build a protein that we need, as long as we can get that gene into a new organism, we can get that new organism to produce that protein that we want. Um, so this idea of genetic engineering has really you know, revolutionized medicine, farming, agriculture, you know, food production, because we can now modify what proteins organisms make we just have to figure out how to introduce the right code into that organism, the right DNA molecule into that organism to get it to make the protein we want it to make. Now, we're simplifying this process greatly, and there's a lot more complicated things that need to take place for this to actually work. But the concept, the overall idea is what we want you to understand is that DNA for any organism is DNA. There's no difference between the A's, the T's, the C's, and the G's when you go from human cells to bacteria cells. As long as you get the right code, in the bacteria cell, the bacteria can produce that protein. So the next step is, well, how do we get that protein? Like we can make the bacteria make a green protein, but who cares if we can't get that protein out? It's no use to us having insulin inside a bunch of bacteria cells if we can't get that insulin out and purify it to give it to the people that need to, to use it. So we talked about this process called column chromatography. Column chromatography is a way of sorting molecules based on size, very similar to a gel, but except we get those molecules in a little tiny tube in a purified form. Um, so we basically did a lab where we broke open all the bacteria cells, dumped the contents into these columns. These columns were stacked with those silicon beads, kind of represented right here by these little circles. And when these 
beads, these uh, beads able, were able to sort these molecules, these different proteins of different sizes, out based on size. And what I love about this diagram, it really shows how the bigger molecules, the red ones, will fall through the column faster because they don't get caught up in the little tiny holes found in those silica beads. And again, I gave you the analogy in that video of the silica beads being like wiffle balls. Um, so the little blue ones get stuck in these wiffle balls. It takes them longer to filter their way down through the column, whereas the red ones fall pretty fast. And so when we look at these tubes um, and we collect a certain amount in each tube, we can make the assumption that the bigger proteins are found in these earlier fraction tubes because we collected those first, and the smaller proteins are found in the last fraction tubes because those are the ones that are falling out last. And so column chromatography is able to sort proteins based on, in this case, their physical size. All right, so I saw a question come up. Can you go over what the colors represent in the tubes? So are you, I think you're, if, you're, if you're referring to these tubes, the different colors represent different size proteins. And you can see that they're different shapes or different sizes in the drawing. So the big red ones fall through faster. The green ones are kind of like our medium size. That'd be these tubes right here fall through at a medium speed and the little blue ones fall through slower because they have to get through all these little holes. They can't bypass those holes in the silica beads in the column. So that's kind of how column chromatography works. And so then we ask you to start analyzing graphs based on concentration and based on size. And I, and I think people struggled with this a lot. So if you look at this graph, this is showing protein concentration. So again, concentration is how much of a protein we have. Um, so if you look at these graphs, B is in a much higher concentration than A. We have, more, we have more of protein B per milliliter of sample than we have of protein A. But based on our understanding of column chromatography, if you go back to here, again, the big ones fall out first, we would say A is a bigger protein than B. Because it fell out in fraction 3, B fell out in fraction 5 through 7. And so A is a bigger protein. It fell faster through the columns. And the SDS page gel backs that up. If you look at column 3, or sorry, fraction 3, we have a protein band right here. So that must be protein A. And you look at fraction 6, we have some bands right here. This band is closer to the well then these bands, which means this band must be smaller, must be a smaller protein because it traveled faster down the gel. And that's where we start getting confused. In a column, big molecules move faster. In a gel, small molecules move faster. So that's going to be something you have to practice analyzing. How can we tell which proteins are bigger in, the, in pictures? Um, if you're referring to these pictures, we're talking about graphs here. If you're looking at a fraction tube graph that has concentration in fraction tubes, that means it went through column chromatography, the bigger proteins will be in the earlier tubes, tubes one through three, let's say, and the smaller proteins are like six through eight. The medium proteins are in the middle. If you're looking at a, a gel, bigger proteins move slower, so this would be the biggest protein right here. This would represent the smallest protein right here. So hopefully that answers your question. How can we tell which proteins are bigger in pictures? I'm assuming that by pictures you mean graphs or pictures of the gel. All right, so again, if you look at this peak on this uh, gel right here, or on this fraction tube, we, need, we see that fraction tube 2 has the highest concentration of protein A. When you look over here on the gel, Okay, let's look at fraction tube two. We see one protein band. What does that tell us? That tells us we've, pur we've purified that protein. That protein is in its pure form. You look at tube B, okay, it peaks right at fraction round num number four. Okay, we have our highest concentration there. Look at fraction four in the, in the gel. We have two bands. That tells us it's not pure. This is, you know, maybe this is protein B right here. Well, this is some other protein that's involved that's not in its pure form. We have two different proteins of different sizes in, in this fraction tube. And look at C, uh, so that color's not showing up very well. There's C, highest concentration is right around six. We would say C, C has also been purified because it's in its, there's only one band in the gel. Again, so a single band in a, in a lane tells us there's one protein in that lane.
Now, um, we could also say, well, C is smaller than A because it went farther down the gel than this band did, and the graph backs us up. C fell out in fraction six, whereas A fell out mostly in fraction two. A is a bigger protein than C. So there's a lot of information that you can you can gain from being able to analyze these graphs um, and analyze a gel. So again, big proteins fall out first, small proteins fall out last. Big proteins are found, oops, higher up in the gel. Smaller proteins are found further down in the gel. Let's see if there's any questions before we move on to GMOs. All right, let's move on then. So genetically modified organisms. Um, in this case, we talked about basically in this objective, you're to, can you identify what a GMO stands for? Like can you understand not just that it's, it means genetically modified organism, like how do we genetically modify an organism? Kind of already touched on that in objective one. Um, can you give an example of a GMO used in food production? Can you basically read an article or, or from a list of examples, be able to pick one out that this has been genetically modified? Um, can you evaluate the positive and negative effects of GMOs? Can you discuss those, you know, why are they good, but why are they also, are there concerns about them? And then can you use gel to identify a GMO? Um, what I did leave off of this is that we'll talk a little bit about some principles of PCR. Um, so I also did add that to the review guide if you haven't looked at the newer version yet. So again, what is a GMO? Well, GMO simply stands for a genetically modified organism. So a genetically modified organism has had new in DNA introduced into it to give it a new characteristic or a new trait. Um, it could be DNA from an organism of the same species. Maybe we're just amplifying uh, the production of a protein from a member of its own species that just produced more. Um, or maybe it's from a completely different species. A lot of the ones that we talk about, a lot of ones that catch you know big news headlines and people are all worried about, are what we call transgenic organisms, organisms that have DNA from a different species. They got a new piece of DNA, like in our Pigo lab. You know, we insert a jellyfish gene into a bacteria. That's a transgenic organism. So here's an example. We have um, corn that is, you know, usually infected by this European corn borer. So this corn borer, this little, little insect, really not that big compared to the corn plant, feeds off of corn and can ruin corn crops. And so what we've found is that there's a bacteria that produces this toxin, this BT toxin, that kills the corn borer. So if the corn borer, this insect, ingests this toxin produced by a bacteria, then that bacteria, then that corn borer is going to die. So instead of spraying the corn with this toxin, let's have the corn produce this toxin. Once we genetically modify this plant to produce its own toxin, we never have to spray pesticides again. We just keep regrowing the same corn. And so we take the gene from the bacteria that produces that BT toxin, incorporate it into the genetic material of the corn plant, and voila, you have a corn that produces a pesticide in its very cells that are going to kill European corn borers. That's an example of a genetically modified food. So how did we test for genetically modified food? Well, we use a process called PCR. You know, for PCR, what we're looking for, we're looking, we're looking for a specific gene, a gene that would tell us that this food has been modified or not. Because again, going back to what is a GMO, it's an organism that has a genetically modified gene in it. It's got a new piece of genetic material. So if we can find that gene in this food, we then know it's genetically modified. So what do we need? Well, we need our sample. We need the template DNA that we're going to copy. So that was the test foods that we all had. You need specific primers that are short pieces of DNA that are going to find the GMO gene that we're looking for. You need a bunch of nucleotides Need because we're building new DNA molecules. So you need the building blocks. You need just buffer to maintain pH and keep everything working the right way. And then you need the enzyme that's going to actually build the new DNA molecules, which is called DNA polymerase 
But PCR, now we're not going to ever test you on this, uses a special polymerase called TAC polymerase because it was found in a, uh, in a enzyme, or sorry, it was found in a bacteria that lives in a hot spring and can withstand high temperatures because when we look at PCR, we have to get DNA to a really high temperature to start the whole reaction to happen. Um, so TAC polymerase can withstand those temperatures and allow us to do PCR very efficiently. So what happens in PCR? Basically, we heat the DNA to pull it apart. That when we say denature the DNA, that pulls the DNA strands apart from each other. Kind of looks like this. We go from the double DNA, double strand DNA, and it gets pulled apart in the heating process. We then cool it down, which allows the primers to attach. And those primers are little segments of DNA that find a specific code matching the A's, T's, C's, and G's that will find the gene that we're looking for. So then we cool it down so that it attaches, and then we heat it back up again just slightly so that enzyme, TAC polymerase, can start copying the gene that we want. And then we just repeat the process. We heat it up, we cool it down, we heat it up again, and then we heat it up to the, the next cycle. So PCR stands for polymerase chain reaction. We are polymerate, we're using polymerase, TAC polymerase, the enzyme to build DNA, and we just keep the reaction going in a cycle. Great question. Why does DNA pull apart in high heat? Well, when you heat up the, the DNA molecule, you break apart the hydrogen bonds. The hydrogen bonds um, are very easily pulled apart when you add heat to something. Um, a great example of this is if you have curly hair and you want to straighten your hair, well, what do you do? You use a straightener. That straightener uses high heat. What you're doing, you're breaking bonds in your hair molecules. Um, that's a great way of thinking about it. That's what straightens out the the proteins that make your hair curly. Um, so um, heat can just break bonds, and it's very easy to break hydrogen bonds. So heating up DNA very easily breaks the hydrogen bonds. Good question. So what were we doing in the lab? Well, we were looking to find a GMO gene. But we also had to make sure that our PCR worked, that we actually got DNA from our samples. So what we also did a separate PCR reaction looking for a plant gene that we would assume all plants have. So we amplified the plant gene to confirm that we extracted DNA from our samples, that we didn't get a negative result because our PCR didn't work. We got a negative result because the plant wasn't a GMO. So we used a highly common chloroplast gene found in almost all plants just to make sure that we actually successfully extracted DNA from our plants. So here's how it worked. We took our sample food that we ground up um, and tried our best to get the DNA out of the cells. We added some of that sample to a, 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 a tube that had GMO primers. They had primers that were looking for the genetically modified gene um, that was used. And we added some of that sample to plant primers that were, these primers found the gene that all plants should have. So theoretically, this one should have worked for everybody. This one would only work if that GMO gene was present. We PCR them in our really expensive PCR um, machine called the thermocycler that basically changes temperature in a predictable way. And we got results. And a lot of you got great results. So again, one and two, lane one and two, and this will be labeled if it's on a test. I should have labeled it here. Lane one and two were our, our controls. We had to know how big the plant gene was and how big the GMO gene was. And so we ran controls in lane one and lane two. And so all of us should have had a band right here showing that we had successfully copied DNA. Now, if we had a band show up right here that matched the GMO gene, this tells us the GMO gene's present in our food sample, telling us the genetically modified organism. If the band is absent, but we do have a plant band right here, that tells us we successfully had DNA, but that DNA did not contain a GMO gene, therefore it's a non-GMO plant. We'll pause for some questions. We can always ask questions about real world situations. We're always gonna be able asking you to apply your understanding to what we've been learning. So yes, 
Um, so memorizing vocabulary is important, um, especially the, the vocabulary from the gene expression part, but you should be able to apply those to more real world situations. Do you need to know the exact process of both labs? No, we're not gonna ask you to like memorize like how PCR works or how we transform the bacteria, but you should know what we learned from those labs, like that in the first PIGLO lab, that we can tr we can transform a bacteria. We can get a bacteria to take in new DNA and produce a new protein, and that that bacteria can control the production of that protein. Um, you should be able to know that we can purify proteins using columns, and we can test to see if they are pure using SDS page. That's the column chromatography lab, and you should be able to understand that we can test for GMOs by looking for GMO genes um, using PCR. Great questions. Why do we need diluted lanes? Um, that kind of goes beyond the scope of what we're going to test you on. But to give you a quick answer, um, sometimes, from what I would, so what I've been told, when you when you go to PCR or sample, if you have too much DNA, the the enzyme, the TAC polymerase, can't find the DNA that it wants to copy very easily. It's like if you have too many people in the hallway, you can't find your friend because the hallway is too crowded. Even though you're really trying, you're finding that you're trying to find that one friend in the hallway. If it's too crowded, it's too hard. So um, we want to make the the PCR tubes less crowded with less DNA, so we can ensure that the primers and the TAC polymerase enzyme can find the gene that we want to copy. Okay, so lane three confirms it's a plant, and lane six confirms it's a, GM, it's a GMO. It's not lane six that confirms it's a GMO. It's any lane that has a gene that matches up to lane two, in this case, that has the GMO gene. Again, I wish I would have labeled it. So imagine there's a label right here that says plant control, GMO control. So any lane, it could be four, it could be six, depending on if the dilution was necessary. Um, any lane that has a band that matches up with a GMO gene tells you it's a GMO plant. So again, a real quick overview of PCR. Oops. Um, we have our template DNA. We, want, we have a piece of DNA we want to copy. Let's say it's a GMO gene. We have a specific primer that will find that GMO gene based on the nucleotide base pairs in that gene. We then heat the DNA up to pull it apart. That allows the primers to bind. Then the TAC polymerase reads the gene we're trying to copy and makes a copy of it. And over many, many cycles, we go from having one version of the gene to two, to four, to eight. After hundred, you know, after like 40 cycles, we get billions of copies of this gene. And that's what allows us to see it in the gel. Something we didn't talk about, and I probably should show, maybe I'll show tomorrow in class, is that the more you PCR sample, the brighter the band you get in your gel. The more copies you have, the thicker that band. We actually kind of talked about that in our Lance Armstrong lab, that thicker bands kind of indicate you have more DNA there. So by PCRing for 100 plus cycles, we can get a very, very thick band. Very easy to tell that we actually have a lot of DNA there. So that's real quick, like how PCR applies to this lab. We're just trying to copy or get lots of copies of a specific gene so we can see it in the gel. Because as you can see in this picture, if we had just one copy of the GMO gene, that's not enough to show up on a gel. We would never know if it was a GMO plant. We need at least you know 10 cycles, 30. We ran 50 cycles for our lab. That gives us enough DNA that it shows up in the gel telling us it's either a GMO or it's not. All right. So that's the last slide I have on this presentation. So if there are any questions, um, please ask them now. I think I've covered them all. Oh, when someone asked, how do we know if we purified, the protein is purified? Let me go back here to our column. I don't know if, if a protein is purified. If it's purified, you'll have a high, a big peak for concentration at a certain fraction tube. So we peaked at fraction tube number two. That means fraction tube has number two has the most of protein A in it. We go over to our SDS page gel. If there's one band in, in fraction tube number two, 
that means there's only one kind of protein there. We also have a purified protein in, in tube number one, but that's not the protein we're looking for. Um, so one band on an SDS page tells us we have a pure protein. If we have multiple bands, that means tube three has like three different proteins in it that is not a purified form. How many test questions total? Uh, I really don't remember. It's going to be probably less than 20, I'd imagine. It's not going to be a very big test, not a very long test, only two objectives um, with, a, with maybe two written questions, one on gene expression, one on GMOs. How do we know what the GMO genes are to PCR? That is something we kind of held a mystery. It did talk about it in the lab. Um, there's a special virus mechanism that we use to actually, when we GMO eukaryotic organisms, this goes beyond the scope of the test, of course, but since you asked, might as well talk about it. When we go to um, genetically modify a plant, typically they use a virus as a way of getting that gene into the plant cells. Just like a virus infects you when you get you sick, scientists engineer a virus to basically transport the gene into a plant cell. And so what we actually are looking for is not the gene that's causing the new trait, it's a virus gene that was used to help get the DNA into the plant cell. And since one virus is commonly used amongst all GMO plants, if you can find that virus gene, we found a GMO plant. Because why else would that virus gene be in a plant if it wasn't for using um, to genetically modify that plant. But again, beyond the scope of the test. So what you need to know is that all we were looking for is a GMO gene. Just keep it general, um, very vague, that we are looking for a GMO gene with specific primers that will find that gene. How do we explain what is a GMO question that will be on the test in detail? So a genetically modified organism is an organism that has new DNA in it that allows it to produce a new protein, which gives it a new trait. I would say that's a pretty general answer for what is a GMO. But again, I'm not going to ask you that specific question. You're going to have to be able to apply your understanding of a GMO using that kind of definition. All right, any other questions? We're almost at 9 o'clock here. A lot of great questions were asked so far. Okay, well, it's... 8.59. I see no more questions popping up on the question bar here. So we're going to shut down for the night. I thank you all for participating. Thank you for asking great questions, making it a really good review session. If more questions do come up, uh, feel free to ask in class tomorrow because tomorrow's our last day to review before our assessment. Um, and thanks for watching. Have a good night.